I'm Haley from Gallifrey Public Radio, a Doctor Who fandom podcast and part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And welcome to Play Comics, the show where we normally look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. But today, we're talking to another creator about their cool stuff. This time, I am talking to Jordan Blum, one of the writers of the Modoc Head Games comic. Jordan, how are you today? I'm doing well, and uh, thank you for, for having me. I will say, uh, I'm, I'm a little bummed we aren't playing a video game adaptation because I, too, love uh, I'm playing those and judging them uh, based on how well they adapted the material and also just weird games based off of things that should have never been franchised like uh, the Home Improvement game or uh, Beethoven Second. I collect all of those kind of oddities. Oh, well, we will definitely take care of that later. <laughs> awesome, awesome. But I, I'm, I'm very excited to be here and to talk about it. Modok is somebody that I've kind of been aware of. I haven't really dove into the character. So, I mean, looking through the first one again over the weekend here, Friday, right, you know, whatever day it was, because I don't know what day it is anymore. Time is meaningless. I know, right? I haven't had to work since Christmas Eve. It's great. <laughs> but, you know, being somebody like me who doesn't really know a lot about the character, I feel like this is going to be a really good, quick introduction, because I'm getting a lot of stuff thrown at me real quick, but it's not, oh no, super exposition for the sake of exposition. Yeah, we, we wanted to make something that you could just kind of dive into the adventure of it all, and, you know, MODOK was created by Stan Lee and, and Jack Kirby, and that Kirby design, I think, is really what's kept him in the in the vernacular all these years, and, and kept people interested in, in, in the character, um, but, you know, he's this kind of brilliant monstrosity, this very arch supervillain who wants to take over the world, but he's always kind of brought down by his ego, and I think that's kind of really all you need to know about him. He's, he's got a computer brain, got mind blasts and a, and a very deadly hover chair, and he's designed only for killing, and I think that's sort of what's really fun about the characters is you can just kind of look at him and learn a little bit about his, you know, general identity, and then you're kind of off to the races. And, you know, I think the character is very adaptable. You know, I don't want to say he's inconsistent over the years, but, but different creators have used him in very different ways, and we sort of built the series around that, around the inconsistencies sometimes of, you know, how can this character be, you know, this very powerful, ruthless villain, and then other times be kind of this joke, and then other times, you know, uh, he's, he's used in a lot of different ways. So we wanted to kind of bring that into the story that because he is a computer brain, you know, perhaps every time he's destroyed or killed and rebooted, uh, he's slightly different than he was previously. And now he's kind of being haunted by these memories of this life he doesn't even remember living. So is it real? Is someone tampering with him? Uh, you know, what version of MODOK are, are we, we following now? And I think that's a nice way to really cover for the inconsistencies the writing you said has had over the years, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I know, it's funny, I don't want to call them inconsistencies because, like, Batman is another character where, you know, he can be this Adam West version, he can be this Christopher Nolan version, this Frank Miller version, you know, uh, this Brave and the Bold the animated version, like, he, he's flexible, and I think MODOK is that as well. This is kind of going along with a Hulu Marvel TV series. So really, what came first, the TV series or the comic? Uh, the TV series came first. So I've always loved the character. I think I learned about him. Yeah, I can never tell if it was from the comics or that Iron Man animated series from the 90s where he was weirdly baby sized in it and they used to push him around. There's like an episode where he's actually in a baby carriage undercover. But I was obsessed uh, and I thought, uh, you know, I needed to know more about this character and I 
dug even deeper in the comics. I bought the action figure that spawned out of that that animated series. So he's always been a character I've been excited about when he pops up, you know, w within the comics. And uh, when uh, a development exec who I'd been, you know, very close with and developed some previous shows with, I uh, had moved to Marvel, we had dinner, and you know, I of course was like, we've got to talk, I have a million ideas, and kind of the one I was most excited about was was MODOK, and, and, and basing a show around him, and trying to figure out, like, you know, where does this guy go uh, after he fights Captain America, you know, like, like, what happens off panel? Like this guy has to have a life. This, this guy doesn't just solely exist, you know, at AIM, uh, you know, planning to take over the world. And it kind of, you know, they were looking for something comedic and they were looking for, you know, something that kind of had, was like a fun spin on a sitcom, but but kind of, you know, upending it and doing something completely different and, and unexpected. So the idea of MODOK having a family you know, having to run an evil organization, like what is it, what goes into running AIM was a really kind of funny question uh, that Pat and I were discussing that we kind of built this show around him that, you know, uh, we gave him a family. We, we decided to, to kind of have him lose control of AIM and it gets bought out by this corporation and, and suddenly he's, he's losing control of everything in his life, of, of his company. You know, he's, he's married, his wife wants a separation and, the idea of of taking this this very arch super villain and giving him a, a midlife crisis we thought there was a lot of comedy in there and then but using the marvel universe as a backdrop and making it still this very action-packed show that's a guy trying to sort out his life who happens to look like moda uh, was really really funny to us and and you know had a lot of of stories to kind of pursue and, and, and to explore with that character. And we liked the idea of trying to humanize this monster, uh, this, this character who basically solves all his problems by mind blasting people away and suddenly he can't fix the things in his life by doing the way, you know, doing the things that a supervillain does. So that was kind of the genesis for the show and we developed it with, with Marvel and, and uh, as we were working on the show, you know, we were talking to different people at Marvel about all these ideas uh, that Pat Oswald and I both co-created the show and also uh, co-writing the, the comic. And we had a bunch of ideas that we wanted to, to kind of explore that didn't make sense for the show. Uh, so we uh, were approached by by Jordan White, the editor at Marvel, to do a MODOK mini. And um, we kind of found ways to, to tie the show to the comic in a way that that I don't think people would expect. Like we're not doing an adaptation of our TV show. We had no interest in in doing that. We wanted to write the six one six Modoc, the 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 kind of much more menacing supervillain version, as opposed to kind of the, the more comedic version from our show. But we liked the idea of going like how you know, would our show make sense in the Marvel Universe? And it kind of led to these, this mystery we could kind of create for MODOK in the, the comic universe. So it was kind of trying to make sense of, again, another world uh, of MODOKs or another version of MODOK uh, with the different versions that have, co that have pre-existed before our version. And, and it kind of led to, to what the comic series ended up being is like, you know, these are very separate takes, very separate versions of the characters. How do you make them make sense together? Eleanor, well, the first two issues of this have been really fun. Um, I grabbed the first one a couple weeks ago and, you know, got the second one from you fairly recently. And I have no excuse for why I didn't grab the first one right when it came out. So I'm sorry to both of you for that. We forgive you. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> and there's a lot of good comics. You know, there's a lot of great comics out right now. I don't blame anyone. You know, it's very tough to make that decision when you're, uh, you know, they're walking the wall trying to figure out what to buy. So what comics writing experience have you had in the past? You know, I know you've written for some TV shows people might have heard of, but, you know, my quick research hasn't really seen a lot of comic stuff. No, uh, you know, Patton has actually written more comics than, than I have. This is my first, but, uh, you know, it's something I've, I've been studying uh, my whole life. You know, I've been a reader since I, before I could read, and there's pictures of me in a high chair holding like a Captain America comic. So it's just, it's it's been my consistent love for my entire life. And, uh, you know, I also am very aware of the 
TV writer, movie writer just coming in and doing their own thing and, you know, uh, not maybe always putting the work in or, or writing the characters with inconsistencies and stuff. And I, I didn't want to do that. So, you know, I've been been kind of studying it forever. And I really wanted to come in and write a love letter for comics that was, you know, hopefully super fun and, you know, doesn't waste a panel. Uh, we wanted to pack the comic with as much kind of action and comedy and, and drama as we could. So, uh, you know, really, uh, I am, I, this, the, the Modoc show was just a very long con on Marvel to get them to let me write a comic book. I'm going to let Jordan know you're going to be in so much trouble. <laughs> oh, he knows. I tell him all the time. I'm like, it worked. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Okay, good. I'm also going to give you full credit because, I mean, reading this thing, I never would have guessed this was your first comic. So you get full credit and Patton gets none because he's not here right now to take any of it. <laughs> well, I can ex- I can accept half of that uh, because Patton is uh, a co-writer and has written some amazing scenes in this. And we and I love collaborating uh, with him. And, and then, like I, I said in a few, I think, other interviews, it was so great because you know he's been Modoc now for for ten episodes of a show. He's he he is fully kind of invested in the character. So when we would be writing lines of dialogue, he would pitch things in his Modoc voice, and it was like, yes, it's exactly how Modoc would would say that or respond in this moment. So it made writing the character uh, incredibly easy to have Modoc right there with you. So one of the things I really enjoyed reading through this too was kind of getting into the mental health aspect of it and Modoc just completely going insane trying to figure out what's going on in his brain. Yeah, uh, you know, we you look at the character and he's brilliant, he's powerful, uh, and yet he always kind of fails because of his own ego. Um, it is this this thing that, that kind of always brings him down. You know, he's so close to winning all the time. And then, you know, he gets defeated by Captain America Iron Man because he can't get out of his own way. And, you know, he was, if you look at his origins, he was this this kind of janitor for AIM that was put into this experiment and, you know, turned into this, he was originally supposed to be this computer that was gonna help AIM take over the world and instead he became so hyper aware and intelligent that he turned on the people who who created him and and uh took over aim and is is a terrible boss and there's been many coups attempted uh by by the people at aim to to, to wrestle control back from him and most people resent him and he's constantly fighting you know with the people on his own team and in his own organization so i love that element of him and i we wanted to kind of play up this idea that there are so many voices in this character's head there's george tarleton the the this original janitor of aim who was who was kind of pulled into this experiment there's uh this computer that is calculating all of these ways to to kill people or accomplish their his goals you know there's the big uh, kind of grand supervillain who likes to brag about everything he does and and kind of have all of those voices competing especially at a time where suddenly he's starting to question everything and that's very unlike Modoc to, to question the things in his life so you know when he thinks he's going insane all of these voices are kind of bubbling to the surface and and um you know, I think the, they did such a great job with the lettering and the comic to give each of these these voices kind of their own unique look uh, and feel. And, and uh, it's one of the things we, we really wanted to play with. And I think when you jump from TV to, to comics, you're kind of looking at like, what are the toys here that are different? And, and one thing you really don't do a ton of in, in television is kind of inner monologuing. So we created multiple inner monologues happening within Modoc's head that are kind of competing for, for his sanity. And the way that they had those multiple inner monologues, too, I mean, I don't know if that was the artist or the letter's decision there, but whoever it was, it's just a genius way of making sure I don't mix up which of Modoc's personalities is telling him what. It was Travis uh, Lanham, who's our editor, uh, came up with the different looks. You know, we said, like, this this font should be different was basically all we gave him. And then he designed uh, all of those. And, you know, especially the, the kind of 
self-doubt version that's kind of scratchier and 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 it's just a kind of white lettering against the black background like interrupting you know as as someone who has uh their own anxiety and is constantly battling it we wanted that voice to have that feeling of like just when you think things are going good this this self-doubt creeps in and um not to spoil anything but there is a payoff to to that as well like it's not just a style thing uh it will come to play out in the plot as well oh good i'm really excited for that because i've been waiting for the payoff and it also it's not spoil anything i don't think it's happened yet from what i've seen no, it, it'll kind of wrap itself up in, in the fourth issue, but it's it's building. You'll get kind of a some some clues as to maybe you know where some of these voices are coming from. So, did you get to use every character that you wanted to in this series? Yeah, uh, I was shocked. Um, you know, we, we we have Iron Man popping up at the end of one, and then he's Kian and Modok go uh, undercover. We won't spoil how Modok goes undercover, but they have to go undercover at a, um, a, a super villain weapons trade show uh, and technology trade show in Vegas. They're kind of CES, and we got to kind of do our, our Casino Royale with, with, with Iron Man and MODOK side by side, which I'm really excited about. So, you know, he's always been, to me, the quintessential MODOK uh, antagonist, or I guess the, the protagonist to, to MODOK's antagonist. Uh, so I love getting to pair them in a way we've never seen them. Um, and then in that issue is, I think there's a million cameos since it's a super villain convention. And a lot of them are actually characters we use uh, in the show as well. We wanted to kind of sprinkle those in. So that was a blast. And then, you know, we, we wanted this series to be kind of a road trip through Modoc's history. So, you know, besides using Iron Man and, and um, you know, Monica Rappuccini, we wanted to use the Serpent Society, who was in the Mark Grunewald run. They assassinated him after AIM hired them in, in the, the 80s Mark Grunewald run. And, and then, you know, they've released the cover for it. We used Gwenpool uh, in issue three, who's a character I love. And again, that was a very different version that, that Mohawked uh, Modoc, who, who showed up in that one, but we wanted to kind of revisit all these different incarnations of Modoc because he's trying to make sense of his own history. So we thought it would be fun to, for him to kind of, uh, you know, meet up with, with each of these characters as he's looking for answers. So uh, there's a few more, I don't think we've, we've that have been spoiled yet, but um, yeah, it was, it, Mar Marvel was awesome about being like, use whoever you want. I, I'm a big X-Men fan. X-Men is, is probably my favorite thing in the world, maybe next to my family. <laughs> so uh, we do have a Krakoa scene in, in issue three because that's where Gwenpool is living these days. So I, I snuck in as many X-Men things as I could uh, and, and none of them were dinged. Uh, thanks. I'm very grateful to Jordan for that. And Lauren, our other editor, who's, who's fantastic as well. And hopefully this isn't too much of a spoiler, but I always appreciate when a bad guy tells a Nazi to get lost in nicer words. Yeah, that was a fun one to write because, you know, I think um, Tony does a good job of calling out Modoc and, and AIM and, and them kind of supplying weapons to people like Hydra and stuff. And, and you know, they're, uh, you know, Modoc's not very happy about about being called a hypocrite. So he, he gets to get a little revenge on on, on some uh, some villains later. I, don't, I won't spoil too much, but uh, that was a very fun, fun scene to write. So is this probably the first of you writing comics and we're gonna see a lot more? I hope so. Um, I've been talking to, to some people about some other possible ones, uh, a mixture of hopefully more for, for Marvel and um, some creator owned stuff. If I if I have my way, uh, I would love to to write these forever. Like I would to the day I die, I would love to have a comic project going. It's it's the most fun I've ever had doing anything. I think it's a mixture of 
of working just so closely uh, with an artist, uh, Scott Hepburn, is unbelievable. Uh, and the, the, getting the pages back from him, you know, getting them popping up in your, in your email is the greatest thrill in the world to see it come to life because it's always a million times better than you ever pictured it. And I love the immediacy of it that, you know, you write it and then a month or two later you get the art and then it's out there and you can hold it. You know, I, I absolutely love writing television, but especially animation takes such a long time. You know, we're still uh, in production on, on the Modoc series and we've been working on it forever and I can't wait for it to air. But there's something so fun about, you know, just working with such a smaller uh, crew and getting immediate results and, and just, you know, building on uh, these stories that have existed for, for so long and and being able to uh, write for an audience that that knows this world so well and is so ingrained that you can kind of, you know, leap forward without having to do any hand-holding or, or worrying about with general audiences you know, understand this, let's take a step, a second to explain this. You can really just kind of dive into the deep end, I think with, with comic audiences, and, and I love that. Yeah, I think it definitely helps that there's a long history of having to go back and look things up. Yeah, I think the continuity is the best part. I mean, that's what I, why I love X-Men so much is I remember, you know, buying some annual, like the Evolutionary War annual with with the X-Men and then suddenly Mojo pops up at the end with the X-Babies and I'm, I was just baffled. And it all it did was it made me want to go back and learn all this continuity, especially from like the Chris Claremont run, which is, was like 17 years, 18 years on the book. Like it's just building and building and building on top of itself and swallowing itself. And there's a long form plotting and, you know, you would you would think you'd have a good grasp. You're like, okay, I understand the Silver Age and I understand the original X-Men. And then, you know, we get to the Bronze Age and I get, the, the, you know, giant size. But what the hell is the Siege Perilous? And why is Psylocke suddenly a ninja? And like trying to to make sense of all of that, I think was like the, the game of, of collecting comics and finding those back issues that kind of unlock the mysteries of, of of all that continuity that, that built on itself. And, and I love that so much. So to get to kind of add to that and, and play with that, or, you know, like I said, we, we bring in the Serpent Society and they, they play a big part in, in uh, the second issue, but it's built upon all this history that you're not even seeing in that issue. We, we hint at it and we have Modoc mention it a little bit, but it was so fun to kind of leaf through our back issues and then, and then bring those in bring the little nuggets of, of, of history. So most of who I've talked to here have been uh, creator-owned people uh, on one level or another. And they've always had to go out and find an artist to do their stuff with them. Um, working with Marvel, you know, they're obviously a little bit of a big deal with that kind of thing. So, like, did they tell you this is the artist and the letter and everything that you're using, or did you and Patton get to pick that or some kind of combination there or what? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of a combination. You know, we we obviously like trust Jordan. Jordan is making the best comics out right now. Like, I can't get enough of all the the, the uh, Dawn of X stuff and, and every X title out there. So, you know, I was just like blown away that we were even getting to work with with him and and his editors and um and then. Uh, he, he came up with a few names and like Scott stuff was just, you know, was so good. He had just come off that Cosmic Ghost Rider comic um, and his Drac series is fantastic. And he just has this energy that matched what we were going to do. Because, you know, when you hear there's a MODOK comic coming out, I don't think you have an idea of what that's going to be. So what Pat and I really wanted to do with the book was like put him in the center of this big kind of this action movie you know like like make him the protagonist of like a mission impossible kind of story uh which i don't think you'd expect modok to be and we need we wanted an artist who, whose energy would match that and like scott can't draw a scene without it having like kinetic energy even like a, you know two people talking at a, a table in the se in the second issue like there's there's glasses being slammed down with like lines coming off of them like you know every panel he draws just just like i said has this, this amazing energy and movement to it and like you know having him be an artist for for a story where we're, we're putting you know modok at the center 
of 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 like an 80s action movie uh was perfect it's it's it you know everything he draws is at an 11 like that the, the war machine page i remember he came back with from, from issue one it's the most guns i've ever seen on war machine you know like he just he just amps everything up and i love it i know that war machine page is amazing the, the hardest part of writing this, this has been like, okay, I know I'm going to buy some pages from this comic, but I want all of them. And trying to figure out how not to blow uh, all of my savings on Scott Hepburnard. That's the trickiest part of the, the whole process. Oh, that's an interesting problem. I never thought about that. I've just gotten into collecting original art, uh, and I've been very picky uh, about it. And then Scott came along, and and now I want everything. But uh, the one that he's sending me that I'm most excited about was that splash page in the first issue, where you get to see Modok be this really lethal, dangerous threat. Because you know, I know everyone knows we're doing this comedic series, but we really wanted to show that like when Modok unleashes, it's scary. So that splash. Page Page where he's just lasering and sawing through all those AIM agents. I, I was so excited when I saw that. It, it to me is like the most iconic MODOK image of the whole series. So that was the one I picked. Uh, and, and he is descending. It's on, on route now. Well, I mean, that's just super cool. See, now I, I want to go write something now just to get original art. You don't even have to pay me money. Just give me the art from it. I would happily take that as payment. It's crazy, yeah, when you see that, like, oh my God, we kind of thought about this, but he made this a million times better, and now I want that. Like, he brought it to life. It's it's incredible, it's, you know, it's like, I remember, you know, working on, on Community, I was trying to steal props, because you want to hold on to a piece of, of of this thing you're doing, you know, like this this physical piece that represents the experience and, and the pages you have, you know, we're gonna have, uh, almost 100 pages of, of Modoc art. You want all of it, so it's, it's tough. But uh, it's a credit to, to Scott, who, like I said, there's not a single wasted page or downtime or boring, you know, talking heads. Everything, you know, he draws just, it, it just jumps off the page. So how much have you written with the specific purpose of making him draw it so that you can try to get the art? There was, I think by the time we got to, to issue three, we were just writing the craziest shit we could, or sorry, the craziest stuff we could think of um, just to see what he would come up with. Um, there, There is some stuff in issue three where um, it, it brings him back to the experiment that created him on this island, Boca Caliente, which AIM has since abandoned. So it's kind of overgrown grown with, you know, uh, nature's kind of taken it back. And, but the, the Modoc experiment has been running on its own uh, and some, some wildlife has, has accidentally and sadly been pulled into it or, or kind of crawled inside of it. So we get to see some Modoc guys animals. Uh, I won't spoil what they are, but that was some of the weirdest stuff, what he was coming back with of like, because the idea is that there, it's, the experiment wasn't overseen by, by AIM soldiers or anything like that, like beekeepers. It, it, so it's, it's kind of like this bottling plant that these things have been shoved into Modoc hover chairs and, and and transformed and they're hideous and disgusting and and and, and tragic and and Scott drew some some Modoc animals that I think will give people nightmares for the rest of their lives. I mean, you realize this is already on my pull list, so you don't have to sell me on it anymore, right? <laughs> oh, it's, I'm, I'm just so excited talking about it. There's some crazy stuff coming that I, I hope people people enjoy. <laughs> so, uh, with the show, um, everything I've seen is said early 2021. Besides me not believing that that's a real time anymore, do we have any more specific timeline? You know, it's going to come down to when we finish it. You know, production's gotten a lot trickier uh, out here. And because of the nature of the show, because it's stop motion, we're, we actually have these, you know, studios at Stupid Buddy. Uh, there are these stages, these kind of little mini, there's like 30 stages of sets and stuff for, for all these locations that we're, we're shooting in that were built by, by Stupid Buddy. And there's so much craftsmanship that goes into, you know, everything from, from the sets to the puppets to the, the cinematography. It's, it's much more like shooting a live action show. So, um, Assuming we don't have 
any more huge shutdowns uh, for production and, and we can keep moving at the pace we're moving at, uh, hopefully you'll be seeing it uh, spring 2021. But we're so excited. We're finishing episodes now and, and it is such an insane show. As crazy as the comic is, I think the show uh, gets even crazier. And um, what's fun is, is I think we're really subverting what people may think the show is. Uh, you know, it's, it is not a, like, multicam Modoc sitcom. It is like a wild, crazy uh, adventure in the Marvel Universe where, you know, we're going everywhere from, from Asgard uh, to uh, uh, the bar with no name, all these kind of classic locations. Um, it's insane the the characters that Marvel has let us use. You know, everyone from from A-lister heroes to, to to me, my favorites are kind of the D-list villains that populate that that bar with no name. Um, it's filled with Easter eggs and cameos and and um, and you know some of the the Marvel characters play bigger uh, roles than others. We 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 tried. It was very hard not to fan fanboy out and just put everything we love into every episode but they're they the characters we use are organic to the story but i think they're gonna be ones that, that fans are really excited about and um uh yeah I, I cannot wait for for people to get to see it and uh it is it is a like the comic a love letter to to the stuff that we grew up reading and, and what we think makes the marvel universe so fun i mean you have to save stuff for the second season anyway right Oh yeah, we got we got a lot, but, but you know we, we we definitely kitchen sink s some elements into this, and I think you're gonna want to have your Marvel Universe handbook uh, ready because yes, like I said, there's some big characters, but there's also some very deep pulls because we had those handbooks in the writers' room and we were using them every day. So I think people will be very surprised at the characters and the uh, we use in the in the places we go. Which version are y'all using in there? We got those those 80s ones, uh, the big thick ones, and I think a few of the 90s ones. Maybe you could put those in binders. Yeah, uh, I I used to love those. So we had a we had a big mixture of those, and then I bought um, a spinner rack, and I filled that with kind of classic comics with all the characters we were using. So, um, you know, because our, our writer's room was mixed, you know, it was a few people who were diehard comic fans, but, you know, others were, were, were kind of new to the, the Marvel Universe, and I think it balanced the show well. So uh, I was never worried about us not being true to the spirit of the comics because of, you know, Pat and I are kind of encyclopedic uh, Marvel fans. So uh, we made sure that, that we kept things, uh, we never betrayed trade the source material, but we were able to go in, in, in new directions with the characters and the stories. So from my understanding, the comic here is four issues and done. And the TV show is, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, um, we're with ten, 10 episodes in the first season. And then, yeah, the comic is, is four issues. Uh, I would I would do it forever if they let me. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully hopefully more MODOK uh, all around in the future. It's a MODOK renaissance right now between the, the video game, you know, uh, I have no knowledge of the movies, so don't quote me on this, but I've heard the rumors you have that maybe he is is popping up in the in the in the future films and and we're getting lego toys it's a good time to be a modoc fan lego toys seem to be a good indication of something that's coming up though because those take some time to get set up yeah yeah i think it's you know he's he's everywhere even uh my son plays him in in contest of champions and then uh we'll have some some merch coming out with the show so uh all the modoc you need is coming i find that hard to believe because we probably need even more. Because it's just such a cool character that you could do so much stuff with. Yeah, the, the, the Mondo Tiki mugs blew my mind. They're huge. Uh, and, and those came out last year. Um, and we've got some, we, we just had a big marketing meeting with Marvel and Hulu, and, and it was a brainstorm. And some of the ideas coming out of there were, were bonkers. Uh, so hopefully they get made and, and hopefully people can buy them. What have you found has been the biggest difference writing for this comic versus writing for TV? Is we didn't want to write the same the same version, which I think I talked about earlier. It was like we, you know, the the Modoc of the comics 
there's so much more to him and so much more history. And, you know, we didn't, we wanted it to be that if you were a fan of MODOK in any iteration, you know, whether it be the Stanley, the Jack Kirby one, the, the, the funnier Gwenpool one, you would find that in, in the comic, um, the version you were looking for, whereas the um, the version in the show, you know, we, we set it in this in this comedic world, and I think you know we take a little more liberties with that and kind of made it our own and had to make the world make sense around him. Um, but it's still, in essence, everything you love about Modoc. So you know, I think the the biggest differences were, uh, you know, we we also only had four issues to tell our story where we had 10 issues or 10, sorry, 10 episodes to kind of tell this much longer story. So it was kind of figuring out, okay, what do we want to get done in these 20 pages? And it's, it's limiting, but also freeing too, because you can really jump through the beats quicker and, and, and plot it differently. So, um, I don't know. I, lo- I don't, I love the, the challenges of, of both mediums and, and really the idea was not to repeat ourselves and to give you very different versions of Moda with very different stories uh, that feel true to the to the mediums we're telling him in. No, no, my wife's not nearly as big of a Modoc fan as I am maybe turning out to be, but I was telling her about what happened in the first issue. And she might actually come grab this and read it as well. I hope she does. I hope she likes it. Uh, my, my wife does not read a ton of couch, but she read it and said she liked it, but I think she has to say that anyway, you know, for our marriage to continue on. Because like Modoc, I have a sensitive ego. Yeah, I mean, my wife will definitely watch the show with me. So at least you've got that. I, I, I think it's a, a show for everyone. If you're a longtime Modoc fan and a Marvel fan, all that stuff's in there for you. If you're someone who just likes shows, you know, like a Big Mouth or Rick and Morty, and you just like animation uh, and comedy, you know, I think you can easily slide in there and not be confused and just enjoy the ride. And then finally, if you had some advice for somebody trying to break into writing comics, what would you tell them? I think it's, it's you know, reading and analyzing it. I started, I sought out a lot of scripts, which are actually harder to find than, than like screenplays because there's not really one format. Um, I've been lucky enough to befriend uh, a few comic writers. Uh, Jerry Duggan uh, is, a, is a good friend and sent me a bunch of scripts. And I really kind of read them along with with the actual finished comics to see how things translated, how to not overwrite to. Um, and I think the, the other big thing was, um, you know, maybe the theme of, of, of this podcast is, is uh, ego, but in TV, uh, as a TV writer, you're, the, the, you're in the driver's seat and you're really in control of, of what uh, the episode is gonna be and, and, and how it comes out and you're there all the way through and post. But in comics, it's really the artist, you know, is directing uh, the, the comic and, and you wanna write for them and you wanna write towards their strengths and you wanna kind of showcase them versus letting your writing be the thing that, that is, is front and center. And, and uh, you know, so you kinda need to take yourself out of it a little bit and be like, how do I make this artist look good? And how do I draw the things that, that are gonna make him shine and, and excite him or her and and uh i think that was a really fun thing to do where you know i'm overseeing every little inch of of the show but here i can really kind of step back and and just be be a fan and see the pages come back uh, you know and see what scott's imagination brings to it so it's a really different process of of kind of who is 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 driving the art form I'm so excited for the end of this and the show. This is going to be so much fun. Dude, thank you so much for having me. And anytime you want to play some video games uh, or talk uh, comic book video games, I love that as well. Oh, well, I will definitely send you a link to that list. I'll also put a link down in the show notes so everybody else can go see it too if they want to come be a guest. But Jordan, you know, it, it's been great talking to you about this. If people want to hear more from you, where else can they find you around the internet? On Twitter and Instagram, I am Bloom Jordan, uh, or at Bloom Jordan, and those are probably the best places. I, I post probably more to 
to Instagram. Uh, I'm trying to get better at Twitter and use it to get the word out on all these projects. Um, but uh, yeah, those are the two places you can find me. And as always, if you want to hear more from me, you can head on over to Twitter at PlayComicsCast or PlayComics.com where, you know, we've got reviews for comics and stuff. There might be one here before number two before it comes out. Maybe not because I'm going to see how long it takes to edit this one because by the time this episode comes out, number one is already here. You can go to your local store and grab it. Number two, I'm going to say pulling stuff out of the dark. You should be able to go grab it tomorrow if you listen to this the day it came out. Otherwise, you can go to your shop and grab both of them, which I think would be a really good move. Everybody should do that. I hope they do. And if you don't, I hope you're waiting for the trade, although I still think you should be buying it now because it's that much fun. Buy it all. Buy it, uh, single issues at the store. Buy them digitally. Buy the trade. Get all the MODOK you can. Yes, do it. Or he will mind blast you from wherever he is at the moment (laughs) absolutely don't don't cross modoc if you want to hear some other wonderfully geeky shows head on over to gunnageek.com where you can check out the wonderful geeky shows over there and if you like the music that we're rudely talking on top of head on over to soundcloud.com slash best dash day to check out best day's music but most of all just grab a game grab a stack of comics bring the tv with you so you can catch the shows too and find yourself a new favorite character Move the window, so where did the button go?